quick sidebar. Uh, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure Mark Ruffalo is not like the reincarnated version of Eugene Debs. As much as, <laughs> as, much as some of us would like that to be true. Uh, but I will say Professor Hulk is probably a socialist, you guys, because he's anti-war, nonviolent, right? He's pro-science, and he shared his tacos with Ant-Man. <laughs> Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of Fork Full of Noodles. I'm your host, Chris Mohan. Uh, you might notice some laughter in this episode, some laughter coming in in the backdrop, some people talking uh, from, from, from the shadows, so it might seem. Uh, but that's because this was recorded in front of a live virtual audience. That's right, it was recorded in front of a live virtual audience. I do uh, weekly Zoom, almost weekly Zoom shows uh, called The Citizen revolution and then they become episodes of fork full of noodles that you're watching right now so if you want to be a part of the live virtual audience you can totally do that you totally have the opportunity to do that uh it's super fun we get to have a q a and a discussion at the very end of it uh and uh, i get to meet you guys and hang out with you guys and talk to you guys so if you want to be a part of that experience you can grab your tickets right now and uh, as a special treat if you become a sustaining member you get free tickets to these live virtual stand-up comedy shows that happen almost every single Friday at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. So make sure you grab those tickets. You can go to my website at krishmohanhaha.com. That's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. Uh, and lastly, I want to say that uh, we uh, were able to raise some money to help the folks at uh, Action for Assange. Uh, to get down to D.C. to cover this trial. So if you want to continue helping them out, check them out at Action for Assange. Uh, make sure you donate to them. Make sure you help them uh, give you guys the, the accurate news when it comes to Julian Assange. So uh, without any further ado, let's dive into this. So America touts itself to be the, the bastion of freedoms, right? Everything we do in this country is based on the concept of freedoms. In one week, I hear the phrase, I can do whatever I want because it's a free country, like at least a dozen times, right? And that statement is inaccurate in so many ways. Like America is the definition of a capitalist state, which means everything has a price tag, including your country. And you can't really do whatever you want because you know, like laws and stuff, <laughs> like those exist. Like for example, like, like you can't masturbate in front of a church on Sunday as the congregation is leaving. That's like a bad idea, right? That's, that's just rude and unnecessary, even if you say it's a protest, because here's the thing, I've been to a couple protests and none have made me feel that good. <laughs> Look, if public urination is considered <laughs> exposing yourself and can get you put on a list and rubbing one out in front of the Lord has to put you on like all the lists, like a hundred percent of them. So it turns out that you can't do whatever you want, you know, because of, because we have laws and stuff. Regardless, uh, there are certain freedoms that I think Americans uh, take for granted or just plain forget about, right? A lot of these freedoms involve the first amendment. It grants Americans the right to free speech, religion, expression, protesting, and even petitioning the government, and of course, the press. Now, freedom of press ensures that journalists can tell us the truth when our government isn't. Freedom of press is for everyone that publishes information, not just the quote unquote, good journalists, right? And, and if it were only for the quote unquote, good journalists, how can we explain Brian Williams' career. 
or I don't know, Tucker Carlson's career or Rachel yeah, Maddow's or Anderson Cooper or, or, or that old prospector outside my apartment that keeps yelling extra, extra, read all about it. Can't. I feel personally attacked. <laughs> <laughs> it's a different prospector, Steve. It's a different prospector. <laughs> I have multiple prospectors outside my apartment. <laughs> but look, these are not good journalists, right? Brian Williams orgasmed over a war on national television. Rachel Maddow has been spreading a conspiracy theory for over four years. And that prospector won't stop looking for gold in my car. These folks, at best, are corporate propagandists and, and also well, one prospector that's probably going to get sued soon, if I'm being honest, right? Like, look, it's a Honda, Randy. Okay, there's no gold in there. It's a very economical car. It's a very nice and economical car. But if you, if you do think that journalists have a, a little too much freedom, then fear not. There is a, a, a very nice... Uh, authoritarian law that has been put into place to to ensure that there are less press freedoms for everybody. On June 15, 1917, two months after America entered World War I, Democratic President Woodrow Wilson and his Congress passed the Espionage Act. The Espionage Act made it a crime for any persons to convey information to interfere with the United States military, the war effort, or promote the success of the country's enemies. And if you're found guilty under the Espionage Act, you go to prison for about 20 years and you could be fined up to $10,000. Now, that's, that was in 1917. So that's like 1917 money. So with like the cost of inflation, that's like a million dollar fine and over a hundred years in prison. Now, the issue with the Espionage Act is the language in the legislation was so vague that it would just go after anybody it saw fit, including folks that remained neutral about the World War I efforts, right? Like, like if you were an entertainer, for example, if you were an entertainer in 1917 and you didn't say, give it up for the troops, huh? Give it up for the troops every 12 minutes, then they could, like, kill you because, you know, you're like a commie pinko freedom hating bastard. It really puts nationalistic pride into law. And this is the authoritarian's Pandora's box that has led to stripping away Americans' most fundamental rights. And because of this fear, the American public has given away those rights willingly. But fear not, folks. Fear not, Woodrow Wilson did not stop there. In 1918, he signed the Sedition Act, which banned the, quote, disloyal, profane, scurrilous, and abusive language about the United States government, the Constitution, the armed forces, or the flag. I mean, this was the jelly to the authoritarian peanut butter that was the Espionage Act. <laughs> That's really what it was. I mean, this made sure that you couldn't call any politician a fuck nugget in writing or out loud. You could whisper it, though. Now, if you think about, if you think about it, this, this law was really written into place to make sure that foreign spies weren't coming into the United States to, you know, steal state secrets and American jobs, and white women. It's really what they were <laughs> trying to protect. But in reality, this act was put into place to persecute socialists, pro-labor, and anti-war activists. Like in 1918, there was a socialist named Schenck who was passing out leaflets discouraging men to join the war and was arrested under the Espionage Act. Guys, he didn't even make a full pamphlet or a brochure. He made a one-page leaflet. I mean, he was imprisoned for a single eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. Like, not even good paper, you know? Like, not cardstock. <laughs> like, we're talking about basic, shitty computer paper. 
That's what he went to prison for. He was, he was brought in under the Espionage Act, which provided for up to 20 years in prison, by the way, for saying things. And he was convicted, and he came up before the Supreme Court, cited, he said, how about the First Amendment? The Supreme Court was unanimous. Supreme Court unanimously determined that the Espionage Act specifically was not violating the freedom of speech or press by jailing people for, you know, like speaking or just reporting the misdeeds of America. Oliver Wendell Holmes wrote the decision. Oliver Wendell Holmes has a great reputation, an intellectual, uh, and, you know, uh, one of the really awesome figures in American uh, jurisprudence, intellectual history, and so on and so on. Well, he says what people have said now. If you hear this all the time. Your mother said it. Maybe your father said it. Your brother-in-law said it. Who knows? Somebody you heard said this. So look, freedom of speech is fine, but you can't shout fire in a crowded theater. Right? How many times have you heard that? Yeah, guys. You can't yell fire in a crowded theater, but you can yell terrorism in a paranoid nation to all the brown countries bend the knee to your whims. So you can't do that. <laughs> I mean, really, how are you supposed to let people know that there's a fire, right? Like, like the most dangerous game of telephone ever? You know, hey, there's a fire. Pass it on. <laughs> like, you know by the end of it, some guy is going to make it about his dick, right? Like, that's, that's always what happens. Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe we can we can make a proclamation of some kind, right? Just stand up and be like, "Hello, I'd like to make the following statement: We did not start the fire, but there is one burning. It wasn't always burning because that's not how arson works. We should probably leave this theater and catch a different showing of Eat, Pray, Love." <laughs> Now, also in 1918, socialist presidential candidate Eugene Debs was arrested in Canton, Ohio, under the Espionage Act and the Sedition Act for giving an anti-war speech. The working class who fight all the battles, the working class who make the supreme sacrifices, the working class who freely shed their blood and furnish their corpses, have never yet had a voice in either declaring war or making peace. Quick sidebar. Uh, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure Mark Ruffalo is not like the reincarnated version of Eugene Debs. As much as, <laughs> as much as some of us would like that to be true. Uh, but I will say Professor Hulk is probably a socialist, you guys. Because he's anti-war, nonviolent, right? He's pro-science, and he shared his tacos with Ant-Man. <laughs> so now, Eugene Debs, uh, after he made his speech, uh, was sentenced to to three ten-year terms in prison in 1918. Uh, from prison, he ran for president in 1920 and got a million votes. Now, mm -hmm. his sentence was, yeah, it was awesome. <laughs> uh, his sentence was commuted because the courts decided uh, that the Sedition Act was just too crazy. <laughs> but they were like, let's keep the Espionage Act in place just to balance things out a little bit. Let's keep doing that. Look, it says something that the courts decided that the Sedition Act is kind of crazy. And I mean, under the Sedition Act, you couldn't even criticize what the American military was wearing for fuck's sake, right? Which, <laughs> which really begs the question, what did Woodrow Wilson have in mind for the troops to wear in 1918, right? Star-spangled capes and a fucking tutu? <laughs> Honestly, I think he probably wanted all the entire troops to dress up like Uncle Sam on the battlefield. I think that's what he really wanted. 
like with the striped pants and everything. Striped pants. Everybody's got to grow a beard and also be a hundred years old. <laughs> they all have to age rapidly. <laughs> yeah, which is not discreet. It's I don't you know I don't want to make a controversial statement here, but uh, Uncle Sam, not not discreet, not discreet. We're going behind enemy lines. I feel like if you're dressed like the American flag, you're probably gonna get shot in the face. So. <laughs> <laughs> Just a quick thought there. Now, the ultimate proof that these pieces of legislation were not about spies or b Russians stealing our women and drinking our vodka is Woodrow Wilson's 1915 State of the Union Address. And now this was given two years before America entered the war and the uh, Espionage Act was, was passed. So uh, Woodrow Wilson, in his speech, states... <laughs> There's an accurate representation of Woodrow Wilson, you guys. Very accurate <laughs> representation. He says, uh, There are citizens of the United States, I blush to admit, born under other flags, but welcomed under our generous naturalization laws to the full freedom and opportunity of America, who have poured the poison of disloyalty into the very arteries of our national life, who have sought to bring the authority and the good name of our government into contempt to destroy our industries wherever they thought it effective for their vindictive purposes to strike at them and debase our politics to use uh, to the uses of foreign intrigue. Oh man. How could they? <laughs> I know, these bastards. The beginning of the statement is basically Wilson stating that he's embarrassed that America is a nation of immigrants <laughs> <laughs> and that naturalization is bestowed upon them by the good graces of the bank owned government. Right? <laughs> I mean, realistically, right it, within the, the very beginning of the statement, he's making the good immigrant argument, right? It's, it's the argument that if you're an immigrant, you do exactly what you're told. When you're told, you get the gifts of citizenship where a bunch of white liberals will yell at you to vote for other old white warmongering liberals. <laughs> it's fun. Good time. Now, he makes another statement, his statement about pouring poison. That's just xenophobia right there, right? It's the argument that foreign cultures are tainting the proud American culture of stealing cultures from black brown and indigenous people <laughs> how could they like ridiculous exactly i mean how is america supposed to steal these cultures if these people are just going to bring it into the country and share with everybody willingly that's just rude it's just rude mm -hmm. is what that is his last statement uh kind of makes the titans of industry sound like defenseless sheep in a den of wolves Right? Like these uber capitals, uh, capitalists were the ones that enacted the Federal Reserve Act, which funded American wars. And all these capitalists were enriching themselves from both sides. Don't forget that John D. Rockefeller was selling the Nazis American standard oil. Right? The good name of the government he speaks of is one that has used the military, uh, military force countless times to attack, maim, and kill striking workers. Remind me again, what kind of a democracy does that? Oh, that's right, an authoritarian democracy, <laughs> you know? One where you get to choose your masters, right? You, you, you get to choose between healthcare and your job, where you get to choose between crippling debt or having a home, right? You, get to, you, get to, you guys get the point. You guys see what I'm doing there. Like standing, standing up for worker rights and ensuring that the working class is taken care of isn't foreign intrigue. It's the most domestic issue there is, right? Calling it foreign intrigue means that you're willing to use the military against people fighting for the rights of other people. But Wilson doesn't stop there. Oh no, if you thought that was the end of Wilson's speech, boy, were we all wrong. He goes, <laughs> <laughs> he goes on. <laughs> He goes on to say, I urge you to enact such laws at the earliest possible moment and feel that in doing so, I am urging you to do nothing less than save the honor and self-respect of the nation. Such creatures of passion 
disloyalty and anarchy must be crushed out. There are not ma- there are not many, but they are infinitely malignant, and the hand of our power should close on them at once. They have formed plots to destroy property. They have entered into conspiracies against the gov- the neutrality of the government. They have sought to pry into every confidential transaction of the government in order to serve interests alien to our own. It is possible to deal with these things very effectually. I need not suggest the terms in which they may be dealt. This is a declaration of war on American citizens that want to improve the lives of other average American citizens. I don't know if you guys know this or not, uh, but it's a fun trick that you guys can, it's like, a par- it's like a fun party trick that you can do, right? If you play the audio of one of Wilson's speeches over just the video of one of Hitler's speeches, they almost sync up. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <They> almost. <laughs> Yeah, if you all you have to do in most of the speeches is replace the the word socialist for Jews, there it's almost a, <laughs> basically the same. It's interesting, right? Like how Wilson refers to the people asking a government to practice social responsibility and have transparency and equality for all uh, all its people as anarchists who are malignant and must be crushed by the hand of the government. <laughs> Remember, yeah. the, the two people in 1918 that were arrested were socialists passing out information and giving a speech. They weren't speaking out against violence, or, or rather, they were speaking out against violence rather than creating it, as Wilson suggests and invokes in his address. I mean, he, he ends that statement with a cryptic West message of having to say what measures must be taken to deal with the threat, right? This is kind of like a wink, wink, nudge, nudge of authoritarianism right there. That's basically what he's doing. Now, it did take Congress about two years to pass the Espionage Act. After peace talks with Germany went south in February of 1915, the Senate passed it immediately, but the House dragged their feet. What the House wanted to do before the bill was passed, they had a few amendments. They had a few points that they wanted to to add in there, and a lot of them included tighter restrictions on freedom of the press. So as many freedoms as the American Bill of Rights grants us, the one that the government has used against us the most is the freedom of fear. Fear is how Americans vote what the religious industrial complex uses, and how Americans treat their neighbors. Presidents like Woodrow Wilson have legislated that freedom of fear into things like the Espionage Act, which eventually gave birth to the Patriot Act, the Rosemary's Babies of all legislations. (coughs) One person, I'll take it. All right. (laughs) (laughs) I wasn't sure who was going to get that reference, but <laughs> I, I got you, boo. I got you. I, I, I'll take the one chortle. <laughs> but look, the Espionage Act, the Patriot Act, this is not what we need, right? These are the freedom of fear is not what we need. What we need is a freedom of education, the freedom of enlightenment, the freedom of transparency, and the freedom of equality. All of these freedoms would eradicate the need for bills like the Espionage Act. And that has been your fork full of noodles for this week. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. If you enjoyed this episode, please give it a thumbs up, give it a share, and make sure people get to actually see this. Share this with your friends, share this with your enemies, share this with whoever you think is going to be excited about uh, a content like this. If you're watching this on the the Facebooks or the YouTubes, if that is your way that you enjoy watching uh, this show, then please make sure that you are subscribed. Please make sure that you hit the bell to get notifications about new videos that I'll be dropping. Uh, I drop videos every single week on this channel. Uh, If you're listening to the audio version, please subscribe there and write us a review. And if you're on Rockfin, thank you for watching this show on Rockfin. Rockfin is a uh, crypto blockchain uh, content producer friendly uh, platform 
it's like the Netflix for uh, co content producers, especially if you like political commentary content like Graham Elwood and Ron Placone, Jimmy Dore, Kim Iverson, Nico House, Convo Couch, uh, Richard Mendhurst, a ton of other people are on Rockfin. And if you, uh, if you subscribe, it's $10 a month, you get access to all of the premium content that is not just available on my channel, but on every single person on Rockfin's channel. So you can go uh, check my Rockfin channel out at rockfin.com slash Krish Mohan, ha ha. Uh, for show dates, to make donations, check out past videos, past podcasts, uh, to, to, to see what press interviews I've done. Uh, you can go directly to my website, which is krishmohanhaha.com. That's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. Uh, thank you to all the people that have already become patrons, already become subscribers, continue to come out to these uh, live virtual comedy shows. Uh, it means a lot, and I really appreciate you guys. Uh, but till next week, thank you for tuning in, and we'll see you on the road.